Good evening. Welcome to another Gateway X clinic. Our next clinician is a lifelong rail fan and model railroad enthusiast. He's the editor of the White River Productions monthly model railroad news and HO collector quarterly. As well as an avid collector and enjoys hobby history, welcome to Mr. Tony Cook. Thanks, Gert. How are you guys doing this week? Another exciting week of shows. Yes. This has become an old hat for you, but it's it's such neat stuff. We'll catch up on sleep next week. <laughs> that sounds like something Gordy would say. Awesome. <laughs> well, all right, I'll take her over here. I'm going to talk about 86 foot high cube box cars. And I'll give the, let me get, there we go. As Gert said, I'm a lifelong railroad enthusiast and model railroad collector. Um, my dad worked for Walters in the late 1960s. I grew up in central Illinois. That top right picture is me there in a black Chevy Corvair in my hometown of Jerseyville, Illinois. Seeing a GM and O freight, that's the kind of stuff I grew up with. Uh, later on, my uh, work included, I was the marketing director for Union Station, Kansas City after it reopened and helped establish our permanent model railroad museum that uh, is being renovated right now. It has trains of all different scales, and that's in downtown Kansas City. And then, oh, as of about 10 years ago, I've been the editor of Model Railroad News, a monthly publication produced by White River Productions. Uh, this is our August issue that's arriving now, and it is Rio Grande themed. We have all kinds of Rio Grande uh, materials in this issue, including the new coach yard brass import Rio Grande steam generator car, which you see there on the cover. We also have in-scale GP30s in Rio Grande, the recent HO Walters mainline SD50 in Rio Grande, and the Accurail HO scale Denver and Salt Lake box car among our reviews. So lots of good stuff. That's monthly. You see our uh, website at the bottom, modelrailroadnews.com. Uh, as Gert mentioned, I'm also the co-editor of HO Collector Quarterly. It is in its uh, going into its fifth year. The latest edition is at the printers and just coming out now and features operating hopper cars and those wonderful 62 foot triple dome tank cars. My co-editor Tony Lucio did both of those cover stories for this latest HO Collector. Uh, I also contribute to Railroad Model Craftsman, another White River publication I do the collector consists that appears quarterly. My most recent one was in the June issue, which you see there, uh, and it's on F units, some of the landmark F units done over the years. So that's a little information on me. As I said, we're going to talk about 86 foot high cube box cars, which this obviously is not. But this was kind of the starting point uh, for the you know research on how box cars evolved. This is a Jerseyville and Eastern. 40 foot box car. And as you can see, this is a very old style car, although steel with rivet sides, it's kind of uh, been rebuilt over the years. And you can see a couple of standard 40 foot box cars on both sides of it, showing the height difference, although all these are plate B cars. Uh, so no excess height here. The 40 foot box car uh, by the 1950s looked more like this. This is a superior door 40 foot Boston and Maine. Uh, Pullman Standard and many other companies, as well as railroads themselves, built these cars. And it was it was just the standard, you know, way that things were transported and everything and many things you wouldn't think of today from grain, uh, even coal in the older days, where they would basically uh, tack boards up across the door opening and fill the car with a commodity that you'd now think would go in some kind of hopper car. But the box car was it. That's how everything traveled at one time on railroads. Uh, box cars grew in size. This is a 50 foot uh, Penn Central subsidiary Peoria and Eastern car. Uh, this again is still a standard, you know, type of box car for general service, more or less. As you notice, there's no cushion coupler. Uh, it is an older style with friction trucks. It still has running boards on the roof, high brake wheel, and uh, tall ladders. As boxcars and all freight cars got more specialized in the 1950s and into the 1960s, sizes got bigger, weights got bigger. Uh, we saw many new cars, covered hoppers, and other specialized things where we basically moved away from boxcars. And the goal on that was to protect shipments better, 
and to have a car that worked better than just what the standard box car was. So you got all sorts of things like air slide hoppers, the various covered hoppers and center flows, uh, big auto racks to carry cars. And all of that starts to hit in the mid to late 1950s and into the 1960s. Now, this car is a mid 60s build, but this is typical of yet another jump for box cars. This is a 60 foot or 62 ish foot car. And this is an early example that still has the uh, running boards on its roof, still has tall ladders, tall brake wheel. But if you notice, it's got cushion couplers, so the extended coupler pockets, uh, which you know helps to protect the load. And those were some of the things that started to come in to some of the more basic cars. As we move into the big high cubes, this was the biggest the box car ever got. And they show up in the early 1960s originally and 86 feet. You hear them reference sometimes as 85 foot, 86 foot. Again, that's, you know, a general thing, just as we say a 50 foot box car, a 40 foot box car might actually be something more on the line of a 53 foot car. So as I talk or mention these, uh, I'll stick with 86 foot, but know that there's probably, you know, a more exact. Uh, measurement, although to my knowledge, all of these are built basically to the same specification. 1963 is the debut for this car. Now this I saw at the St. Louis RPM meet, uh, I believe it was last year, 2019. This is a custom built model. I believe it was at the Wabash Society booth. And unfortunately I was not able to locate the person that built it, but I took a picture of it. And this is a prototype scheme and this car is actually the Atherin Blue Box four door. And when you say four door, you say, well, I only see two. But in high cubes, the reference generally goes to both sides of the car. So this is a four door car, meaning two insulated plug doors per side. American Car and Foundry built this first one in mid 1963. It was a project done in cooperation with three railroads, which you see there on the right side of the car Louisville and Nashville, Southern Pacific and Wabash. And it was done for Ford, and you see Ford stamping cars, uh, or yes, stamping car on its name. So Ford Motor Company was the uh, the client or the customer that the railroads were trying to better serve, and ACF joined in this project. These cars initially carried uh, a lot of auto parts, and when you say auto parts, you're talking like fenders, hoods, things that are bulky and large, but not necessarily heavy in weight. Thus, you can go out to 86 feet and still have a car that's not too heavy to you know, operate the, or go past the 100 ton mark. So ACF builds this first car and it's ACFX 101. But then although American Car and Foundry was a major builder of freight cars, they don't stay with high cubes. They're not a builder when the cars go into regular production. The three major companies that built high cube box cars beginning at the same time in the early 1960s were Greenville, Thrall, and Pullman Standard, with Greenville building the most cars. Uh, Greenville will be the one that I'll focus on with a lot in the prototype uh, pictures. Greenville, sadly, has been largely omitted from a lot of model production. Now, the old Atherin Blue Box high cube box car is similar to a Greenville, although both styles of cars that Aston released around 1970 in its HO Blue Box line both have some things about them that kind of don't pass as far as being exact towards a prototype, you know, which is typical of a car of now going on 50 years old. But here's the, uh, the four door version of the Greenville car. And as far as spotting features go to look for these on looking for these cars, uh, the fish belly type frame is a good spotting feature for the Greenville. And what I mean by that is as you follow from the stirrup steps in along the sill of the car, you'll see right past the trucks that fish belly style uh, dip in the, uh, the side of the car, which carries the lower track of the uh, plug doors. The Greenville is riveted side and there are different phases to it. And we'll look at those. Uh, here's the thrall car. And again, it's like at a glance, like, well, isn't that the same? But if you notice going in from the stirrup steps on the thrall, there's no fish belly to it. There's a slight curve there right by the stirrup step. And then essentially a straight sill runs across the bottom. And the thrall car has a welded side. If you notice the vertical panels there, 
don't have the bumps for rivets. So, and again, I'm talking in kind of generalities here, but as far as glancing at a picture and saying, oh, that's a thrall or, oh, that's a Pullman standard, you know, my goal here is just to give you some things where you can quickly tell apart the three majors. So the thrall car generally mostly a straight sill versus this fish belly type sill of the uh, Greenville. Greenville, as you can see, the dots, the vertical dots there on the sides of rivets, the thrall car welded side. Then Pullman Standard also built high cubes. Uh, and by the way, as I mentioned these things, I must thank uh, James Kincaid, uh, who helped me with some pictures and information and drawings for this presentation. This is one of his pictures. This is a Pullman Standard builder's picture. And this is their four-door car. I think the Pullman Standards are the easiest to uh, identify. It has welded sides, but you'll notice along the sill, it has a straight sill similar to Thrall but you see the uh, vertical posts are exposed across the bottom, that the, uh, the smooth side to the car essentially ends at the lower part of the uh, door. It matches up pretty much to the silver insulated plug doors. And each of those kind of sliver posts you see, they continue up on the car that this exterior smooth side uh, sheeting was put on them. But the Pullman cars basically show the uh, the lower tips of the exterior post. So that's how you can tell a Pullman. The other builder of some quantity was Southern Pacific's cotton belts and Santa Fe's Pacific car and foundry examples. These are really neat cars, but they are definitely, you know, less common compared to the three major builders. This is an early picture of a PC and F car. As you can see, it's got a high brake wheel. It has running boards. Uh, and it is uh, outside braced, which essentially the other cars would be too, but they're covered with panels across the side to give them a smooth look. Uh, these cars, again, I believe are exclusive to Santa Fe had some, SP and its subsidiary Cotton Belt had some, and they did get modernized. Uh, I'll touch upon that here in a moment. Uh, but this this car to date uh, are, did not have the same production or popularity that the other three major builders had as far as quantities built. As I stated, the cars, these cars were really built on the line. They come out in 1963. 1966 is when the railroad rules changed on high brake wheels and rooftop running boards. Now these cars were some of the first to kind of get, oh, they, they got to drop the high brake wheel and ladders ahead of that 66 rule that came in. And that's where a lot of cars start getting modernized beginning in the second half of the 1960s when running boards came off cars and many railroads, many cars started, they dropped the brake wheel and the high ladders. So in a way we are, you're kind of familiar with seeing these cars as a very modern looking car. So it may seem odd, but there was a group of them built those first couple of years in the Santa Fe car on the left shows that high ladder, the edge of the running boards is clearly seen there on the top, and then it's got a high brake wheel. So there are some cars that very much have an older appearance. Now the SP car on the right is showing its uh, A end, so not the brake wheel end. And as you can see, it was, there's a little bit of like a cleat or a, a post there in the top center that it probably had running boards as well, and they'd already been stripped off. And the A end of these cars naturally would not have tall ladders on this side as there would not be access to the top of the car. As I mentioned, Greenville built the most. Uh, Greenville was a major builder of freight cars. And as you can see here, this is an ad from Simmons Boardman's Railway Age uh, magazine. And this shows covered hoppers. Uh, basically everything here is a hundred ton-ish car of the early 1960s. And um, uh, among them, you see Greenville showing its high cubes with the Erie, Lackawanna, Southern, and Penn Central cars in the center of the image. The Greenville car in its phase one style is shown here. As you can see, there's no actual ladder on this car. Those are grab irons running up the side to reach the running boards. This Pennsylvania car is an early uh, example of Greenville's. Again, look at the fish belly frame and the rivets, there's a row of rivets running along the sill and then vertical rivets for the panels. Uh, this style too, if you notice, on the out on the edges where the grab irons are going up, 
before you get to the area that's been paneled over for the exterior post, you notice it stands out a little bit. And there's kind of a recessed or indented area back there along the stirrup step and up those grab irons on the side. Now Greenville's production will change and I'll show you another version of their car where this area is not as wide as it is there. But this is a neat picture of an early example of this car that would be 1963-64 uh, production. That This would be the as-delivered look with access to the roof, running boards up top, and tall brake wheel. These cars hung around forever and as was done with many other cars, they got modernized. This Western Pacific car and wanted to take a minute here to also mention these cars for modelers and collectors have some of the neatest paint schemes that because of the big sides and the large billboard lettering, even a fairly plain car like this boxcar Red Western Pacific is neat with the distribution dividend with the arrows logo on the left side, that all of them are such awesome looking cars. This uh, Greenville is an early phase, this is a phase one and would have been an early car on Western Pacific's roster, but you can see it's been modernized. Uh, they torched off the grab irons going up to the top. You see the, the black dots there would be where they cut the grab irons off on the right side of the car. The running boards are gone, but that small like poster cleat is still up there in the top center in the white excess height panel. And then the brake wheel has been moved down and you can see some markings on the end of the car showing where that was changed. So again, they, they didn't have this look for long that as everything was modernized, so were these cars. So many of them you'll see give evidence that this was an early car that had that, that more traditional look of tall ladders, brake wheel and uh, running boards, but they changed quickly in service. And coupled to it is a DT&I car on the left that's in the same situation that it was modernized. Here's another phase of Greenville production. This is another builder's photo that was uh, shared with me uh, by James Kincaid. This is a Frisco car. It would have been yellow with uh, silver doors. And again, Greenville, the fish belly side and the rivets. Now you'll notice on this one, however, that that indented area where the grab irons go is almost no wider than the grab irons themselves. And this version of car, to my knowledge, is always built modern. There was no older with roof walks uh, and tall, la yeah, tall grab irons and, and brake wheel. That this style comes a few years later and again has the recessed pattern or sides is much smaller. Oops. Greenville also built eight doors. All three of the majors built both four doors and eight doors. Uh, it's a little tougher to tell, but again, there's, as you can see, coming in from the stirrup step, it's, uh, there's a bit of a fish belly side. On the other builders, it is more of just a straight drop, and it's closer to the stirrup step. This is Greenville's eight-door car. Uh, all of these cars basically carry the white excess height warning. That's the white panel or white uh, section along the top. Uh, uh, in the ends of the car, you see it, it says no running board in excess height. The white band basically at the bottom of it would be the height of a regular box car. Uh, the information that I've always heard and I think is fairly correct is four door cars uh, often work Ford plants and these eight door cars work General Motors plants. But again, I don't know that for a fact and I've heard some conflicting information at times of yes and no but I think that's a general thing that you can go by. This is a B&O car that would have been repainted in the 1970s into chassis system paint. And again, it's an example of Greenville's eight door car. Thrall was the next major builder or the next largest builder of uh, high cube box cars. Here's an example of a Thrall four door. And as you can see, the sill is fairly straight and that you don't have the same, um, it's a welded side car, so there's not the rivet pattern that's apparent on the Greenville. And again, on all these, there's some phase differences, and a few of them got rebuilt in the later 80s and into the 1990s, which can change their look as well. And again, a note on the, uh, the paint schemes, you know, this awesome Indian red Santa Fe with the big super shock control, and most of them had silver doors, the white ends. These cars really stood out in trains and were always so awesome to see. But this, uh, I believe, is a Thrall four-door car. 
and here's Thrall's eight-door car. And again, it's very similar in a way to Greenville's, but it has a more, uh, it less of that, that angled edge to its lower sill. As these cars matured and got older, the eight-door cars in general were in much less quantity originally, that as far as all three of the major builders go, they generally built four-door cars for the most part. In fact, I think the Greenville breakdown works to almost eight or nine out of 10 or four-door that Greenville built out of its total production. And I think that also transfers to Pullman Standard and Thrall. So in general, the four-door car, not this eight-door car, is the common one. Um, as they, they did hang around, they went into other service. Uh, of all, they've, they serve things like food. I know that Chicago Northwestern has some cars marked with XL service. They did like breakfast cereal plants to carry things like that. Uh, Union Pacific and some others. And again, I'm talking four-door cars uh, serve like paper products. Uh, that they survived, but I don't know that eight-door cars really had the same longevity and, and are still around. Uh, you still see four-door cars today, but I can't tell you the last time I've seen an eight-door car, I, I don't think they're still around. The minority builder of the major three was Pullman Standard. This, again, is another ad from uh, Railway Age magazine and comes to us from Simmons Boardman Publications. Uh, you see here, this is, these are HO models, I believe, and show a collection of box cars, including the little green car. In the foreground is the offshoot of the high cube. That's the 40 foot baby high cube, which came out in the late 1960s and was available as a sliding door car. There's also an insulated plug door and an outside brace car. And they were built by a number of companies. And uh, these smaller cars generally carried appliances and not, not auto parts, but they basically were called a baby high cube and they were babies in reference to the larger 86 foot cars, which is that purplish car in the background there, a uh, four door example of it is shown. And it, by the way, I think that's the Atherin HO car, which is closer to a Greenville car. So in Pullman's ad, they actually show what would be more of a Greenville car, but I guess they weren't rivet counters as whoever was putting that together for them. The Pullman car, here it is uh, as a Frisco car, another sharp paint scheme. And as I noted, uh, the way to tell the Pullmans, they really stand out among the other cars because they show the lower edges of their exterior posts. Uh, this is uh, late, I think this is about a 1980 picture. You can see the, the stacked uh, cot stencil on the right side, the black white outline that shows like the lube information and when the car was serviced. This also has the yellow dot, that black square with the yellow dot in the lower right corner shows that its wheels were checked. That was an issue in the late 1970s uh, with some wheel problems and cars had to be checked for interchange. If it had a yellow dot, the wheels checked out and it was good for interchange. If that dot is white, the wheels had to stay on the home road and could not be interchanged. Uh, one thing to note here on the Pullman standards, you'll notice there's really not a recessed area, that the ladders on both ends sit in a recessed area, but it's just a notch. If you see above the ladders, we go back to that, you know, that exterior smooth surface comes across there. So another spotting feature on Pullman standards high cubes is uh, the fact that the ladders sit in an indention but there's not a recessed area on the ends as you'll find on the Greenville and Thrall cars. This is an example of an eight door Pullman standard. And again, this is a great shot. This is one I found on the uh, internet. So is the Frisco. And again, it shows the, the exterior posts protruding there at the bottom. Uh, this is a Conrail quality scheme, which would put it in the uh, probably late eighties and also, these cars are, you see, the exceeds plate F, which is, you know, height and uh, width of the car. So plate B is like a 40-foot box car, but as you get out to bigger cars, uh, longer, wider, that the standards go, uh, the warning basically saying plate F, so would not be able to go everywhere on every railroad. We'll take a look at the numbers here. The cars, as I mentioned, start in the early 1960s, 1963, with that ACF car. 
and production continued into the late 1970s. However, by the early 1970s, I believe after 1974, Greenville is the only builder for 86 foot high cubes that after 74 thrall and Pullman standard were out of the game. This shows you, and these are general approximate numbers. I think the Greenville number I've seen is actually 4,809, but I rounded it up to 5,000. And then the information I've seen is Thrall built about 1,000 less than Greenville, so that would put them around 4,000, and that Pullman Standards output was about half of Greenville's, or 2,500. I don't have figures on the Pacific Car and Foundry, and there's also a few other odd cars, Whitehead and Kales, that built the superstructure uh, for early auto racks, built at least one prototype car similar to how ACF built one car for uh, uh, the high cube design. But again, if you're looking at them in general, there's three to look for. These are the three companies and those are the production numbers on high cubes. As I mentioned, they did hang around and they did see some revisions. Uh, this is a later phase car. You see those notches around the center of the trucks are jacking pads, which is added to some of the later cars. This is a Western Pacific car repainted in uh, Union Pacific, but still carrying its Western Pacific reporting marks. These cars are still around quite a bit today. I do see them from time to time in Kansas City in trains uh, over in central Illinois. When I visit my family, uh, my dad and I have chased trains on the Kansas City Southern that will have two or three of these cars. They're usually like CP or CN with just reporting marks on the side. And uh, our information is they're carrying appliances built in Mexico, home appliances like refrigerators being brought up to the US. And I will apologize if you hear my dog barking. He was taking a nap, but and after, and although he was told he had to be good for this presentation, it looks like we're having some, some issues. But so anyway, I apologize for the barking. Resources on these cars, I highly recommend picking up mainline modelers January 2004 and February 2004 editions. James Kincaid does this two-part series that covers the Greenville 86-foot high cubes. There's scale drawings. There's complete roster information. It does focus mainly on the four-door cars, but eight-door cars are listed in the roster as well. Uh, James goes through the different phases and gives a lot of good information on them. And in 2003, I believe he did a similar run on the Pullman Standard cars. Uh, David Kasdorf's 86-foot boxcars, as you see there on the left side, that kind of maroon cover, or boxcar red covered book, uh, you can find that as well. I believe uh, David has a website, and you'll also find that on Amazon available. It's a paperback book and is roster information, although it does have many black and white pictures. And it was done, as you see there, it says 2012. And what he does is go through and, and find what cars are still in service today or then and uh, references them to like when they were built and the prototypes that they represent. We're going to move on to models, and I'm going to focus mainly on the HO cars just due to a time constraint, but I will also note uh, some of the in-scale cars. The first plastic model to arrive came in 1970. This is a railroad model craftsman ad that Atherin ran. Uh, the high cubes came out at the same time that the Alco PAs arrived for Atherin's line. The four door and eight door high cubes came out at the same time. As you see there at the bottom part of the ad, Atherin's 86 foot twin monsters, as they called them. Uh, they were blue box kits and sold for $4.98. Here is that four-door car, and as I mentioned, it at a glance, it very much is a Greenville car because of the fish belly frame, although you'll see it's the right side there stamped thrall, which again is typical of you know this time. This is actually a later production. I think this might be a 90s car uh, after the company was sold following Irv Athens passing away in 1991, but in general, the car's you know, got lettered several different things. So that Thrall logo sits below the Cox stencil and the number and such, it probably does represent a Thrall prototype, but the model itself is a Greenville-ish car. I think where this car comes up short, oh, well, I've got the picture here. Oh, 
I don't. There, I have it there. I guess I didn't get the bigger picture. Sorry. Uh, the car comes up short in that it has welded sides. The side vertical panels, there is the rivet line across the sill, but the vertical panels show welded when they should be riveted. So for its day, it's really a fairly respectable attempt and pretty close to a Greenville car. Uh, everything is molded on it, as was typical of the, the blue box era cars. The only separate part is a brake wheel goes on the one end. The other car that Ather did, the eight door, is a bit more of a mix. Uh, in general, I think its sides and its look is suggestive of thrall, but it shows those lower edges of the exterior post similar to Pullman standard, but doesn't quite show enough of them. You can see the posts running along uh, beneath the doors and along the bottom. So in a way it's a Pullman standard, in a way it's a thrall, I suppose if you wanted to try to make it something, you could probably try to cut or get rid of those small exterior post tips that are showing and try to turn it into a thrall car if you wanted to. Um, but again, this you know, it, it's maybe a little less uh, close to anything. Um, and again, both these cars came out at the same time around 1970. Also in the late 1960s to around 1970, the first brass model of a 86 foot high cube came out. Trains Incorporated imported it from Japan and later it was available from LMB, a distributor in the east. Uh, again, this looks like a Greenville four door car. Uh, the car came without trucks. I believe those are roundhouse trucks I put on it for this picture, but the Trains Incorporated car just comes in a white box with, it's got the underframe and posts ready to accept couplers and trucks, but it came without them. Uh, I forget, I think this car retailed for around $20 back in 1970, and they're fairly available. Uh, you see them pop up on eBay, and if you're a collector of models, a big brass high cube is pretty cool. Uh, this one is in fair shape. As you can see, it's got some damage and things to the, the side. I've really done nothing with it uh, after I picked it up, but... It is a very neat car. Again, this dates to around 1970. It was in the initial group of Trains Incorporated imports, and then LMB imported it again in the 1970s. I believe they may have also done an eight-door uh, import as well of a high cube. The first really serious quality uh, plastic reproduction came from Walther's and dates to around 2000. There's many versions of this car. So if you're out there looking for them, uh, be aware that one size is, or one release is not all the same. They were in Walther's regular line, they were in the gold line, and then they went to the proto line. Uh, these examples here are not proto, but this shows both versions. Walther's did the Pullman standard cars, and they did a, a very good job you know, of representing them. Things are mostly molded on the door runners and rails and such, uh, you know, are part of the shell. The ladders in the indented areas on the ends are separate. And then they do have a separate crossover platform on the end, the gray molded piece, uh, which is solid plastic on the early examples. Uh, but these were the first kind of serious, uh, good 86 foot high cubes on the market. They did both Pullman standards four and eight door. And the cars did go through some changes, as I mentioned. Um, here's two. This is the eight-door Grand Trunk. And then this is the, as I mentioned, Northwestern, you know, some of the survivors, he says food service only with the black XF on the side. Uh, that car, the yellow car on the right here, is the last release. And this is a Walters Proto Edition. And it has a little better underframe detail. And then, as you can see, it has an open etched metal crossover platform you can see through it versus the solid plastic on the left there for the Grand Trunk. Now when they did upgrade this to the Proto line, uh, I believe only four doors were done and mostly done in more modern schemes like this late Northwestern. So if you're looking for some of the earlier schemes, the older style is the only way you can get those. The If you're trying to tell them apart, the very first runs just say Walther's ready to roll and they have plastic wheels, and I believe they have Bachman plastic whisker, easy made couplers. When the car moved to the gold line, it got metal wheels and it got 
uh, different knuckle couplers, which the grand trunk there, I believe, is that next to the gold line. And then for Proto, it gets the Proto Max metal couplers, as I mentioned, enhanced underframe detail, the see through etched crossover platforms, uh, make it a Proto car. And these have not been run in, oh, I think it's going on almost at least six to eight years that since that four door run of proto cars was done and it, it, it i believe is the only time they were done as proto i said i'd mention in scale briefly the in scalers got a car that ho never got um, this is a roco produced 86 foot high cube that follows the pc and f car and they even did it as it early the early version with running boards and tall ladders this car i think was in the mini tricks line it was also sold by atlas uh, there's also two versions of a green village car, four door and eight door that sold, I believe from Atlas or many tricks. Then they were later from, no, I'm sorry, Rapido and later Walters and Concord, I think sold both of those, those you can, uh, find in a couple of different versions and then fantastic, uh, high cubes. Are available today from Blueford shops. They do the Pullman standard four and eight door and in scale. And I believe Trainworks may have uh, a high cube as well. So in scale is well covered there now. And if you need a mantelpiece, man, I can't tell you enough about the Lionel car. I got the Wabash version with the, it's a dark blue with the big Wabash flag on the side. I bought one for myself and then bought one for my dad because I thought they were so neat. But this is a scale 148th reproduction that Lionel did. It does have, you know, I think you can convert it to scale couplers and such. Uh, I don't operate or do much with those scales. So this was just a car that I wanted to get because it was a really awesome big box car. But you'll find Lionel makes, and I think they also do the eight door car. But if you're into freight cars and stuff, this is a car to look for to have one in your collection because they are pretty awesome. I'm going to wrap up there. That gives you some information on uh, the high cubes. Uh, right now, this edition of HO Collector is hitting newsstands. I got my printer copy of it in the last couple of days. So if you're a subscriber, they should be arriving in the mail and arriving uh, newsstands and hobby shops as well. Uh, head later this year in the fourth quarter HO Collector, we will be doing uh, Tyco's Virginian models with their train sets and the variations on the C430. And just a reminder to stop by shop.whiteriverproductions.com to find out more about all our books and our ever-growing line of magazines. Rail Pace News Magazine is now a member of the White River family. Uh, so stop by and you can subscribe, buy individual issues, and see our books as well by going to shop.whiteriverproductions.com. And that wraps up my presentation on these cars. I hope that uh, it was some neat information. They're really awesome cars that uh, I guess the interesting thing is for the models that have been done over the years, the most popular one, the largest production, the Greenville, uh, doesn't exist as a good plastic model. So there's certainly, you know, cars that we, we'd like to see come out that uh, Walters makes a good version of the Pullman standard, but, uh, the, that Greenville is certainly needed, and that Pacific Car and Foundry, the exterior post for SB and Santa Fe fans, would be an awesome car to see show up as well. Is there a demand for these cars? I think so. I think it's one of those at first you can say, oh, they're, they're such long cars that, you know, that they'd be prohibitive for, you know, a lot of guys operating on tight radius curves. But same as passenger cars and piggyback flat cars and the auto carriers. I think even guys that maybe can't, you know, run them that well because they've got tighter curves uh, still like to have them because, again, they're just awesome cars because they're so big. Now, the Walters cars will turn on 24 radius, and they did have a nice coupler mechanism, and the old Atherin cars have a long swinging coupler that it probably maybe even gets you around to 22. Wow. So we have one question here, and I'm not sure if it's a trick question, but since they would be sent to separate Ford or GM plants in the 90s, in the 1970s, would you see only four or eight door cars in a cut? And see, that's one of the things I'm still looking into. It's my understanding that 
and a lot of them there was like the Ford Fast Freight that operated on like Rock Island, Mopac, Rio Grande, Western Pacific from Detroit to the West Coast to a manufacturing plant for Ford. And there was also a GM train as well. So I would think if you see pictures on some of these trains, I think you'll find that yes, like the Ford Fast Freight probably always had four door cars. And then GM trains would have had the eight door cars. But I don't know that for an absolute fact. I do know if you look above the uh, uh, the road number and reporting marks, you'll see initials on many of the cars, and that relates to what uh, what plant they interchange to. So they were in a captive service in general. Same as the baby high cubes, basically all ran out of like I think it was Kentucky or some place that built appliances. So they might go all over the place, but they all had to come back to the same source because that's where they were loaded. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's correct, that four-door is Ford, eight-door is uh, General Motors, and I've never heard reference to Chrysler. I don't know how or how that worked, and for that matter, American Motors in Wisconsin, I don't know if they you know, participated or used these cars either. Someone else noted that the um well first thank you for all the detailed info um he saw the kd stick out due to a minimum radius problem oh uh, no what was that again he said i see the kd stick out due to a minimum radius problem uh well that or the cushioning the all these were cushioned cars so that bar in the center if they would get a hard coupling or just a hard startup or stop to help protect the things inside the car that would shift back and forth. So the cushion coupler, which is helpful for model railroading too, gives them that little extra length. And you'll find cushion stuff on, you know, everything from a lot of the late Santa Fe cabooses got cushion couplers for an improved ride to box cars of 40, 50, 60 foot. Anything with that arm sticking out is probably a cushion car. And all the high cubes are cushioned, to my knowledge. Do you have any G-scale examples? I don't know if G-scale has one. It might. And boy, if there is now, i got to find out and have one. But <laughs> <laughs> so no, I, I can't confirm if there. I know there's some G-scale 60-foot like high cube box cars, but I don't know about an 86. I'll have to look. Would you know if a lot of people scratch built these? Uh, there was a quality craft model available in the 60s that was wood with cast metal ends that you could build i think it's planned show a pullman standard car so there was that wood kit and again with the atherns being available from about 1970 on and the cars only date from 64 i think ho for sure and n scale had a number of cars by the late 60s we always had if they weren't perfect, at least ready-made starting points. As I mentioned on the Athens, there's certain things you do to correct them, and you could carve off, you know, the grab irons, uh, cut off the stirrup steps, and make them more scale. So I've seen a lot of attempts because these cars were available for so long as basic models before the Walters came along around 2000. That oh, a lot of guys worked on these cars to make, you know, something that look really awesome and custom painted. Pretty cool. So uh, that's the end of the questions I have here. Since our wheel is broken, something to do with sandpaper and cricket, which we Americans might not know anything about. How about you give the audience a question that uh, they could answer in the chat for us? A question. Um, hmm. Name a major railroad that didn't own the high cubes. A lot of railroads had them, but what's a big road that didn't have them? Perfect. That's a that's a really good question. We'll uh we'll grab the answer off you, Tony, and thanks for the the clinic, and we'll be back shortly. Thanks, guys. Have a good evening. Thank you, sir.